the last topic, we looked at the discrete time state model. Now we're going to look at the solution to that discrete time state model. So here's the what the model looks like. And this is the linear time varying version. Time varying meaning that the matrices A, B, C, and D are all functions themselves explicitly of time. So an important question is, what does the state actually mean? What does the state transition matrix do? What does the response look like? So these are some important questions as we go into this whole discussion of the state model. So the concept of state is we have, again, multivariable systems, so multiple states going on, all doing whatever they do. And so what the concept of state is, is that the response from time from some time t naught and beyond depends only on the input from this point on and the state at this point on. So that's the concept of state. The state basically captures all the essence of everything that has gone on prior and the way it affects what goes on in the future. That's, that's what the concept of the state implies. So in the linear time invariant case, we have this state model. And so notice that we're concerned primarily with the state model at this point, not the output equation. x at the next time is equal to some constant times x at the present time plus some constant times the input at the present time. And we have some initial condition x0. So to solve this difference equation, we basically iterate. We start at time t0. We plug t0 in here, and we get this. So x at time 1 is equal to a at times x at time 0 plus b u at time 0. We now let t equals 1. When we let t equals 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. And so we get all of this stuff, ax1 plus b u1. But x1 we solved in the previous step. So we plug that all in here. And we simplify, and we get this expression. So we now have the expression of the state at time 2. We then increment t. And so here, x at 3 is equal to a times x of 2 plus b times u of 2. x of 2 is all this stuff. And so we plug it in, simplify, we get this. And so we could keep going. And if we do, this is the solution that we get. So notice that x at time k is equal to the matrix a raised to the power k times the initial condition, plus all of this stuff. So note, as we notice this sum going on, we notice that the powers of A are decreasing. The, the, the index in U is increasing. Okay, And so we get this summation. Okay, And so this is the solution for a given initial condition and for a given input sequence. This is the value of x at time k. And we can see how it plays out in previous versions of x. So in this case, in the discrete time state, we're able to explicitly get, in a fairly simple way, the solution to the difference equation, the state model. So basically, given the state equation and an initial state and an input sequence from time 0 up to k minus 1, we have this solution. So this is the solution. This, is, this first term is called the natural response. So this is the response of the system when you have no input to the system. That is, when you just have an initial condition that's not 0. So the system itself will continue, may continue to do stuff according to this expression. And, and this, it's a function of k, clearly. Similarly, you have this term that involves the input, but not the initial condition. And this is called the forced response. This is the response of the system that we would get when the initial condition is 0. So this is the response that we get. And there is clearly a relationship between this response here and the transfer function of the system, or what we might call the transfer function. We haven't got to that yet, but um, there is that relationship. Notice that this summation is actually a convolution. It's a discrete convolution in, in um, involving the system and involving the input. So we actually get a convolution, which we know for systems that the input of a dynamic system, uh, when we apply an input to a dynamic system, we get a 
convolution. And so here it pops right out. So that's the forced response. Now, in terms of what we're actually looking at in this whole scenario, we have now our forced response, our, our um, natural response involves something called a state transition matrix. In this case, for the linear time invariant system, the state transition matrix for a discrete time system is A raised to the power K. And we have something called the control map. The control map takes the input sequence and gives us the value of a state. So that is the control map. So we have the two parts of our response. Now, this concept of a state transition matrix is a very powerful thing, and also the control map is a very powerful thing. We can actually extend this result to more, a more complicated case. So, in general, a state transition matrix satisfies these conditions. So, x at time k is given by the state transition matrix times x at time l. So, this is for the unforced condition. So, if we start at, at time l and we go to time k, the state transition matrix is just a matrix and it multiplies whatever was going on at l to give us the response at k. So that's the power of the state transition matrix. It's just a matrix. Once you have fixed K and L, this is just a matrix. And, and this, is, this is the basic response, the basic uh, characteristic of the state transition matrix. Now the state transition matrix actually has a number of properties. First property is that for the linear time invariant case, the state transition matrix is A to the power K minus L. So notice we saw in the, in the response before that we just had a to the power k, but the initial condition at that point was zero. That is, l was zero. So in general, when l is not zero, when you start at some other time and go to some other time, you get this as our state transition matrix. The state transition matrix k given k from k to k. So in other words, if we have x of k here and x of k here, this is just the identity matrix. And so that is a property of the state transition matrix. The state transition matrix, if we go not from just L to K, but from L to K plus 1, you can show that the state transition matrix must satisfy this pr property. It's A times the state transition matrix from K to L, or L to K. And so for an unforced system, we start at time initial condition 0, go to time K, we use the state transition matrix from 0 to K. If we start at time L, we take the state, state transition matrix KL, to give us that transition. So this is the linear time invariant case and how it works with the state transition matrix. If we work for the linear time varying case, that is our A and our B are functions of time, functions of K, then we can still describe the solution of the difference equation according to this expression. Again, the unforced solution. And the state transition matrix now satisfies these what are called semi-group properties. A group is, is a, like a collection of things, uh, of math objects, that have similar properties. And anyway, this, the, sem, the state transition matrix satisfies these semi-group properties. First, we have, again, that the state transition matrix from time k to time k is just the identity. So we had that before. The state transition matrix from L to k plus 1 is given by a to the, a at k times phi of k and l. So notice that this is we actually had these two properties before in the linear time invariant case. Uh, the difference was that in, in this case, a can be a function of time itself. And finally, the state transition matrix, if we go from t0 to t2, can be written as the state transition matrix from t0 to t1 and from t1 to t2 where T1 is somewhere in between T1 and T2. And again, we have the transition property that is, satis that is satisfied by the state transition matrix. So even for a time invariant case, not time varying, I'm, I'm sorry, for the time invariant or the time varying case, we have these properties of the state transition matrix. Now we actually have an explicit formula for the state transition matrix in the event that A is time invariant. In the event that we do not have something time invariant, we have a different formula or a different expression for the state transition matrix. What does that look like? 
Well, it looks like this. So again, in, in this case, for the linear time varying case, x at the next time is equal to a times x. a is a function of time. And again, we have some initial condition at time t naught. So instead of time starting at time t zero, t um, zero, we're starting at time t naught. And so x at the next time is equal to a at t naught times x at t naught. So that's just substituting t naught in here. And we go through and we iterate like we did before. x at t naught plus two is equal to t a of t naught plus one, x of t naught plus one, x of t naught plus one we got in the previous step. We plug that in and we get this expression. And if we keep, keep iterating, if we go all the way to some general time t, we get this expression. That is, we just keep multiplying the various instances of a as we go through. So in, in the time invariant case, all of these are the same, and that's why we get a to the power k. But in general, these will not be all the same. But the overall state transition matrix is the product of all of those guys. So phi of t naught and t is just the product of a at time t naught all the way up to a at time t minus 1. So that is, that is the state transition matrix. It's just the product of the instances of a at the various times. So we have now looked at the natural solution, that is the state transition matrix, for the discrete time system.